trying to take over. I hope it is working. Is, am I screen sharing? I'm not. You are not yet. Okay, oh, that's a problem. There we go. Let's get out of this thing and, and uh, not mess up again. Let's see. That means share screen. There you are, share screen. And now I share screen and I go share. And I can close this thing here and I can go full screen. And hopefully it's working. You're on. All right, very good folks. So um, I was planning to solve the Schrodinger equation for a many body system, but I'm not sure this crowd is worth it. So I'm not gonna do any solving any equations for you, but I'll do something else. I'll show you some cartoons. So here's the first thing that came to me, okay? How is my computer prototype or presentation going on? Now, the Futures Plus boss is right there on the screen. That's me. I said, great. But then what happens? The reality strikes in, and I realize that simultaneity is what finally is totally successful and not started at the same time. So that's a disclaimer. So having kept that in mind, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and that explain why I am the way I am. Did my Berkeley PhD in applied physics, and that's me. I used to be skinny once with glasses and a lot of hair. Uh, IBM scientist, my 10 years of scientist in IBM and HP, scattering physics, radiation physics, tunneling spectroscopy, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, then I degenerated myself becoming uh, a businessman, if you will, created a company, took it public, ran it for 20 years. And then I'm now gone to the world of wine. So I finally come back out of it. And anybody that wants to connect with me should keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about quantum computing. Um, I'd first like to tell you about digital computers or classical computers, quantum physics. I'd like to stop briefly for a few questions, as George said, uh, and then finally get to the meat of the matter, quantum computers, and there'll be more questions and discussions. To understand computing, I think we should really take a quick look back at history, how far we've come. 2,000 years ago, the Chinese abacus, uh, still being used by some, a slide rule that I use as recently as 1980s, invented, I didn't know that, in 1620. Uh, and this is all, an, quote, analog computers. Um, a, amazing machine created by a guy by the name of Babbage that some of you may have heard of, mechanical difference machines, all with, with gears and so on. It was able to calculate logarithms with those things. Uh, William Farrell created a electromechanical tide predicting machine. And of course, the bomb was, the war was won with a bomb site uh, that was created uh, with a very sophisticated uh, analog computer with mechanical optical devices uh, on that were on airplanes. And as recently as 1960, we, we had these gigantic analog computers uh, installed by a company called EAI. In parallel with all this, as long ago as 1847, George Boole created a form of logic, uh, which is now called Boolean logic, uh, an algebra uh, with just one and zeros that enabled complete mathematical operations through tables and like. Shannon in the 1930s took that idea and created mathematical operations, uh, arithmetic operations, and enabled the creation of gates. In fact, using Boolean logic uh, and using binary systems, we created uh, means of encoding complex information. Um, and this is a 16-bit system that you can see. And of course, with that, we were able to create digital logic gates. All this happened in the 1930s uh, before we had semiconductors. In fact, human ingenuity took us to a level where we took vacuum tube electronics, relays, operational amplifiers, all kinds of complex things like that, and created monstrous machines to do uh, various calculations including breaking, attempting to break and succeeding in breaking German ciphers uh, with the Colossus. And in 1960s, a 19,000 tube, uh, you know, amplifier tubes, uh, uh, a Turing complete machine. Now Turing, I just throw that in, uh, is of course the father of computation uh, science and computer science in that he, he, he envisioned and created a whole system uh, that would enable us to uh, define uh, computer science. 
semiconductor technology came uh, from a different part of the world, material science. In 1940s, uh, we realized that we could take the ideas of quantum physics and dope silicon uh, with materials like phosphorus and arsenic and create what is known as P-type or positive N-type negative uh, uh, materials. And, and these would be quantum phenomena with classical behavior. And with those materials, uh, guys like Bardeen, Shockley, and Britton created the transistor, uh, which of course led to the revolution of, as we all know, of integrated circuits, the 60s and 70s and the 1980s and today. Um, I remember in the 80s uh, having a, a solid state memory computer with maybe a thousand transistors was incredible. In fact, I remember having as a child uh, a, a transistor radio that had just one or two transistors. And today we have 30 billion of these critters on a chip, a chip the size of a fingernail. To create this incredible technology, we need to appreciate you know, what it means in terms of size. Um, a cell, a human cell, coronavirus cell is in the neighborhood of 100,000 nanometers, which is, you know, um, 100,000 millionth of an inch, a millionth of a meter. Uh, human hair, about 25, that's diameter of human hair, 25,000 nanometers. Typical semiconductor line bits are 14 nanometers and that silicon atom 0.2. So we have about 25 or 30 silicon atoms in a typical line width. And there's a photograph at the bottom. Um, I hope you can see my arrows that show the 32 and 22 nanometer transistors. So we've come a long way uh, and, uh, and with a technology that is pretty comprehensive, complete me memory arithmetic logic control units all integrated into one system. And in fact, now quite often the chip. And that's why we can have all of that happening on our phones. It's mind boggling. Systems are pervasive. Uh, this is a photograph of 1972 IBM 370 168 computer. In fact, I kind of uh, got started on this when I first joined IBM in New York uh, and the Watson Research Center. Um, eight megabytes of, of solid state memory, virtual memory of 64 megabytes, uh, which is enormous. And uh, afterwards, some, somebody wants to hear some stories about me and my experiences, even on the Thanksgiving weekend, I'll tell you about that. Today, of course, we progressed to an supercomputers. Uh, the IBM Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge has 250 petabytes, which is 250 million gigabytes. So one of these gigabyte things we walk around with in our pockets, 250 million of those in this one computer. And the speed with which the darn thing calculates is 200,000 trillion calculations per second. It's mind boggling. And this is the, this is the critter that uh, beat Gary Kasparov. No, it's his predecessor actually, uh, beat Gary Kasparov at, at chess, if you may remember. It's amazing. Um, and of course, languages. Back in the IBM days when I was there, we had three or four major languages, Fortran of course, and COBOL and the like. Uh, now there's 700 operating languages led by things like C++ and Python. And of course, one does not need to say anything about the World Wide Web uh, that got its birth at ARPANET. So NetNet is quantum physics based semiconductor materials enables classical deterministic digital computing. I will state that again in that today's computing is, is a deterministic process. If you start with certain input parameters and input things, you'll get a certain answer and always be that. It's totally deterministic, you repeat it, it it'll be exactly that, unless of course you do some probabilistic Monte Carlo calculations. But setting those aside, it's a deterministic computation. However, the technology that we use inside is quantum physics-based semiconductor materials. When we go into the world of quantum physics and which is what is exploited by quantum computers, the world is very different. And this little chart, I attempt to give you an understanding and appreciation for the difference between classical physics and quantum physics. In 
classical, phys classical physics is essentially macroscopic, us, everything we see around us, everything we touch. Quantum physics is microscopic at atomic and subatomic level. That's the most obvious, simple thing they can talk about. The other very important thing is quantum physics is continuous. Um, you can crank up your thermostat, you can turn on your stove, you can do everything in a continuous manner. There, but on the other hand, quantum physics has quantization. Things occur in discrete steps. You can have one times this and two times that and five times that, but not 3.5 or 4.8. And that's amazing. Classical physics has specific entities. A particle's a particle, a wave's a wave. You know what it is. Quantum physics, the entities are, I like almost called confused. This underlying duality that just seems to exist simultaneously. Classical physics is local. Quantum physics is non-local. And this is the most strange, bizarre part of quantum physics that is totally counterintuitive. And I'll come to that. I'll spend some time on it. Finally, classical physics is deterministic. Quantum physics is probabilistic. It's got built-in uncertainty. For example, if you were to take a cannonball and, and shoot it, the first cannonball and the, or the 20th cannonball, if they were shot with exactly the same parameters, under the exactly the same conditions, they will land in exactly the same place. We expect that, we see that, but that does not happen in at the subatomic level. If we were to shoot a photon, an electron, with exactly the same initial conditions, they would not end up in the same exact location. They would end up in a distribution that is very accurately predicted by quantum physics, but it's a probability distribution. Mahir, while you're at this uh, slide. Could you just uh, clarify the uh, terminology local? Local is just where an entity is. Um, and non-local um, is, is entities that are in separate locations that somehow are, get connected. Okay. So key con quantum physics concepts that we will get to uh, would be quantum energy, wave particle duality, quantum uncertainty, and quantum entanglement. And then I'll stop briefly for questions. So I will go through these con uh, concepts. And indeed, George, I will answer locality also in, in the context of quantum entanglement. Okay, thank you. And non-locality for that matter. So first, in 1900, Max Planck realized as he was studying black body radiation and so on, that he could not get that to work unless he artificially introduced a thing called quanta, uh, which would be a energy in chunks. Einstein, in trying to explain the photoelectric effect, realized that he could not explain photoelectric effect uh, unless he had energy transmitted in and out of materials in a quantized form. It's a discrete, uh, What's the expression that Rita one would use? Indivisible unit of energy. Uh, and, and in that indivisible unit of energy is what is transmitted back and forth. If we take a, a model of a simple thing like a, like a hydrogen atom, and this is a very simplistic model because reality electrons don't go in orbits. They go in a cloud, if you will, uh, and uh, and but but the con but the concept is that it trans the energy needed to move an electron from one cloud to another cloud one state to another state is quantized it's a fixed amount of energy if you put in less it won't move if you put in uh, uh, more it'll it'll move that one amount and not use the rest so it's it's extremely important to understand that the energy transfer in and out of an atom is quantized. And that is a, 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 an amazing fact of uh, quantum physics and that quantum transfer occurs instantaneously between states. Louis de Broglie in 1924 postulated that particles would also behave like waves. And uh, this was amazing, like all particles. Uh, of course, it's seen that somewhat in the case of electrons but you know, and, and photons uh, or light, uh, but 
all particles. And sure enough, we've been able to do an experiment that's called a double slit experiment. And I could literally spend an hour discussing the experiment uh, where particles sent through two slits act like waves, but impinge as particles. And, and what you see here, these little grainy things here is, are particles impinging uh, in a distribution. Uh, and the case of double slit, of course, because it's going as a wave through these two slits, they interfere like a wave does. And again, without going into details, if you were to have an observer be at any one of those slits, the wave action would, would disappear and because you localize things and so on. And, and there's uh, all of these incomprehensible uh, effects that occur uh, as waves and particles are interwoven in nature. So in brief, a particle has wave-like behavior until it is measured, and then it's found to be in a discrete location. You know, and we, of course, in physics call it the wave function collapse. The third is Werner Heisenberg uh, determines mathematically that for quantum physics to be correct, it has to have inherent uncertainties built in. Quite incredible. Uh, and of course, as time went on, we were able to measure this very, very accurately. But all measurements are intrinsically probabilistic and, and you can only measure, uh, say, speed or momentum and position with a certain degree of accuracy. If you measured one very accurately, the other would become extremely inaccurate or conversely. And, and that again is a, is a very unique aspect of quantum physics. And finally, uh, Schrodinger recognized this in his great wave equation that it showed a situation where if a pair of particles were created in this, in this wave function, this equation, those two pairs, paired particles would have common properties, would be entangled. One would affect the other. Einstein, it bothered him so much that he took a, a, a fair amount of time at Princeton with two young guys, uh, uh, Rosen and Podolsky, the EPR paper, where they did thought experiments to, sh to show that it was absurd that this could possibly happen. The spooky action distance could not be correct. And in fact, quantum physics was incomplete theory. And he had difficulty believing and accepting that. And understandably, because you know all of us uh, uh, would have difficulty understanding if particles are paired, why would they remain entangled? But, but the reality is, and I'll show you in a minute, that they are. So paired particles have common properties. Two twins, two brothers. But what's interesting is when you separate them, measuring one affects the other instantaneously and independent of distance. And this is the kind of thing that is fundamentally against any intuition. And yet it is a reality. John Bell in 1964 proposed experiments that one could measure correlations due to this, due to this uh, entanglement possibility and correlations due to locality, two separate locations or ent entanglement. And the Bell's theorem or inequality would actually demonstrate if uh, indeed the correlations were uh, a chance, probabilistic correlations, or they were coupled in a quantum system. My two years before I got my PhD, a young man at Berkeley uh, did a P his PhD thesis where, where he showed that these paired photons three meters apart had indeed correlation. Uh, Friedman, um, his PhD thesis were not highly recognized, but about 10 years later, Alan Aspect in Austria, I believe, uh, did experiments with uh, photons that were 12 meters apart. Uh, and that distance 12 meters apart would mean that uh, if in the hypothetical sense of one photon was somehow communicating with the other one, 
to enable this entanglement to occur. The communication requires something to happen to go between them at twice the speed of light, which is of course meaningless uh, or absurd because you know we know that communication, any uh, information transfer is at the speed of light. So it was at that time starting to be clear to physicists around the world that entanglement was indeed real. But it became especially clear after the Geneva experiments where 30 kilometers apart, um, where paired photons showed entanglement. And since then, there have been many experiments done. I just want to point out the Chinese ones that have become quite famous with uh, 1.2 kilometers uh, apart stations. And then recently they entangled memories uh, with fibers or, or dozens of kilometers. So entanglement is real. And my good friend at Yale tells me it is like a, the Vegas problem. Uh, so as you may know, it's said that what happens in Vegas really remains in Vegas. Well, unfortunately, entanglement will now make it that what happens in Vegas actually travels anywhere instantaneously. Uh, so be careful. OK, for those of you that go to Vegas. And quantum physics certainly makes that happen. So is quantum physics an accurate theory? It's an insanely accurate theory. Measuring the anomalous magnetic moment of electron, it's called G factor. Um, the mesh, measure value, and only physicists would get this, I don't know, uh, what's, what's the expression, anal, I guess, to, to measure things to, to uh, 14 digits of precision, but extraordinary experiments were done, one part in trillion accuracy, and indeed the QED, quantum electrodynamic measurements, calculates all these to exactly these decimal places. So it's an incredibly accurate theory. Niels Bohr, one of the fathers of quantum physics, said that if quantum physics doesn't profoundly shock you, you haven't understood it. Einstein, of course, the ultimate intuitive genius and classicist believe that God does not believe play dice. But unfortunately, rest in peace, Professor Einstein, indeed God does seem to want to play dice. And Richard Feynman says, I can safely say nobody understands quantum mechanics and, and, and the understanding I think in, is in the human sense, the way we think of quantum mechanics. So I want to say that intrinsically probabilistic, and it appears to us as weird, spooky, and incomprehensible. And I'd like to have a brief stop for questions. Let me take the, the first question if I can, Mahir, and then if anybody else has one, put it in the chat and we'll bring it up. Um, so uh, if I am to understand quantum computing, not as a conceptualizer, but rather as a user, Okay, do I need to understand quantum physics? As you'll see in a few minutes, having this understanding or at least acceptance, whether you understand or not, at least if you accept this as a reality, it'll make it easier for you to understand qubits. Okay, so, so what happens is the qubits themselves are gonna seem weird, spooky and incomprehensible unless I'm willing to accept that that's what's true. I would, yes, they are, they are weird, spooky, and incomprehensible. And the reality is they, they behave that way. And okay. we humans are, are clever enough to make them behave that way. Okay. Uh, other uh, questions at this point? Uh, what, uh, from Gabriel, what causes pairing? Ah, very good question. Um, the conventional way has been uh, that when a an atom, for example, uh, is energetically uh, bombarded with something uh, and, and it is able to emit two photons, those photons are paired at that time. And, and they have linked properties, paired properties, uh, and, or uh, emission of ions. Uh, though all of those kind of things that happen in uh, from a, 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 at a birth, if you will, a moment of creation. Now, what you'll see in quantum computing is they're able to now 
also entangle separate things, which is which is very spooky indeed. But I'll uh, I'll come to that in a minute. But traditionally, of course, it is through the creation at the point of creation. Could you take uh, another shot at describing entanglement? Ah. Oh. Well, um, a pair of particles, whether it's a fo two photon particles or electrons, at the point of creation would have uh, appropriately common properties. I use appropriately because, for example, uh, in the case of uh, two electrons, uh, at the point of creation, one we spin up, the other spin down, kind of thing. So, so th they would have this pairing. Photons might have polarization pairing, and then as they leave and they go apart for tens of kilometers, or as far as we can measure them in these days, they would maintain those properties. Now, what's incredible is when you measure one, the other one would have an appropriate property associated with that pairing. And, and that's, that's, but before you measure it, they are in this, in this state, superposition state, where all these things are possible. And, and so this is the unique aspect of entanglement where the effect remains uh, paired until you measure it, until okay. you unpair it, until you actually do something to it on one of them. The other one instantaneously does what it's supposed to do. That's what's so incomprehensible and that's how the great Albert Einstein rightly said, it doesn't make sense. Mother nature should not act that way. And he's probably right. Mother nature should not act that way, but mother nature does. She is what she is. She doesn't ask her permission. Okay, and then one last question, and then we'll, we'll continue with the talk. Um, we talk pairs. Are there ever combinations that are more than a pair? Ah, good question. I don't know the answer. Okay, that's an allowed answer. Um, so let's go ahead. All right. So, Quantum physics and computer science both were born about the same time. Uh, on the left, you see pictures of the kind of who's who in quantum physics, Bohr, Einstein, Pauli, all those kind of guys, right-hand side, Turing, uh, Church, and Post. And then in the 1980s, uh, my, Richard Feynman at Caltech suggested uh, that perhaps the best way or the only way to really do uh, have a get a clear understanding of, of quantum phenomena is to use something like a quantum computer. Uh, it's quite amazing he he had that foresight. And David Deutsch, uh, professor at Oxford, uh, created some of the first algorithms. And so I would say the, the two guys who are in a certain sense the the founders of quantum computing. So what I like to do next is to give you an understanding of qubits and the properties of qubits combining qubits with gates, anatomy of a quantum computer, <laughs> applications, future, and access. And I'll open up for discussions after that. So first, classical bit. On the left-hand side, a zero and one. This is a something we are used to. Uh, electrical charge or, or a quantity of charge in a semiconductor door, the absence of presence of charge. A qubit, on the other hand, is this entity that is both zero and one, and in fact, some other phases of that. And that's why you see this blue color, for example. And by phase, I mean things like properties like spin or polarization, all that we embedded in this, this thing. What is this thing? Well, this thing could be a photon that's polarized, that has both right and left polarization, it could be an ion, up downs, and we even created some artificial uh, atoms, if you will, called transmon. And I'll come to that in a few minutes. That's amazing. It's it's, it's a superconducting Josephson junction circuit. 
uh, that behaves like an artificial atom. And, and that is used at least one of the most popular uses, both Google and IBM use that. Now, this darn qubit, as strange as it is, has superpowers, superposition, interference, and ent entanglement. And I'll come to each one of them in a turn. Superposition. What is superposition? Well, it is a qubit that acts like it's got zero, one, and all the various states in between. And when I say various states, please bear with me. They are literally complex states. It, it's a it's a thing on a like the uh, it's because it's a it's built with complex numbers. Uh, it has on a block sphere all the possible things that you could have. Uh, so just bear with me on that. But a simple analogy is is like a coin that's spinning. It is both head and tails until it stops. So superposition enables a qubit to have this complexity that's inherent in its existence. Corn of inter interference is where you can take these qubits with different states, phases, so on, and get them to interfere, cancel, disappear, or be additive. In this case, the picture I'm showing you, they disappear. Uh, An analogy would be waves, uh, in-phase waves, as we all know, add, out-of-phase waves on the right-hand side, subtract, uh, and they are constructive or destructive. And so in one ways, I can think of qubit interference as like kind of like noise-canceling headphones. You know, they cancel out all the bad stuff and, and amplify the good stuff. Simple analogy, but bear with me. Now we finally get to the fun thing, quantum entanglement. Again, two qubits uh, entangled uh, before measurement, after measurement, entangling, the, once you untangle them, measuring one affects the other as we know, and it's instantaneous and independent. I have no analogy for this, uh, metaphysics or mysticism or whatever you wanna do, but it's reality. Now the comes the question, how do we make com quantum computers with these crazy things called qubits? So imagine if you will, your five qubit system on the left-hand side. And these, these five qubit systems would have two states for simplicity. And they would not be additive as you would have in, in a conventional uh, arithmetic operation. They would be productized. In fact, it's a matrix product. That's just mathematical complexity. The net net is the five qubits combined would have 32 states or two to the five states. And that's what's shown in this thing called a block sphere. When you entangle these guys, now all of a sudden the property changes in that these 32 states would, would be ones where you would have uh, a different property for this entangled set of 32 states than the original uh, original uh, five qubits that were paired, or that were not paired, I'm sorry, that were uh, brought together as a system. The opportunity with this is that a, a qubit would have enough information in it to represent a significant number of classical bits in an it's entangled state. A two qubit system, for example, would have as many as 512 bits. And when you get to 30 qubits, you can have 17 gigabytes of individual classical bits. 35 would have 550. And when you get to 100 qubit system, you have more than the atoms on the planet Earth and 200, 280 more than atoms in the universe. So it's mind boggling the richness with which these qubits can, uh, and a combination of qubits appropriately uh, entangled could create a data set that can be then utilized for calculation. Now comes this very interesting part. You have these qubits. Oh, that's nice. But what are you gonna do with these darn things? You gotta be able to manipulate them. You gotta do something with them. And so they've invented these things called qubit gates, human invention. 
and I'll tell you how they work in a few minutes. But take, bear with me that these gates would act on the qubit. So what you see in the right-hand side picture is this qubit here with this phase sticking up this way would now be rotated partially by this gate. And so these qubits operate on gates. To me, it's like they're domesticating qubits. They can get them to interfere, they can get them to entangle, they can do lots of interesting things and they perform matrix operations. So just to summarize, a qubit is unit, unit information. Gates and a collection of gates provide control to a circuit. And therefore they become units of computation. Classical gates, we, we know many of them, very popular, and, or, more, knots, et cetera. Quantum gates, many of them, 25 of them. There's Pauli, spin up, I'm down, Hadamard gates, all kinds of gates for measurements. And uh, each of these gates represents a matrix operation acting on these qubits. And it's, to me, it's mind boggling. I've attempted to study this at this stage of my life and it's not easy, uh, but I can tell you it's mind boggling that we can now create physical entities, these gates that will actually perform some of these operations. For example, in a quantum circuit, you would have a bit flip gate. It's called a Pauli bit flip gate. There's a Hadamard gate that, that's, that forces superposition. There's a measurement gates that actually ends up now finally getting things to be measured. And these gates all come together. And, and uh, but before I actually show you how they all come together, let me just give you a, a kind of a an appreciation in the context of classical computing. Today's computers, you start with the initial configuration, you do some intermediate calculations, and eventually you come up with a final answer. And it's repeatable. If you were to do today's probabilistic classical computer, the same kind of thing. And if you maintain the same probability, the same condition, you probably got the same answer, even if it's probabilistic. However, with quantum computing, these probabilities in the context of these uh, qubits, which are represented in these matrices that have these complex numbers, they have phases, and they can actually cancel each other or suppress themselves, or, or they can add and enhance. And this is the, the magic of probabilistic quantum computing, uh, that this kind of stuff on paper, they're able to do in practice. And I'll come to that in just a few minutes. So the anatomy of quantum computing would be you might, for example, in the case of, uh, let's say, six um, uh, qubits, uh, create a system uh, with uh, five, say two to the five is 32, 32 uh, uh, qubit uh, states, you create them equal, equal superposition. Then you would encode this by using these gates to initiate entanglement to initial in interference. And then finally, as I mentioned, there's a quote magic. And it's an ultra fast magic in microseconds before decoherence, before these qubits kind of disappear and, and die. You interfere all these states and a very few outcomes would come out of this. So I can only see this in terms of two guys standing at the blackboard saying quantum fault tolerance occurs here. And then um, sure enough, there's magic, a miracle. And, and it, it is uh, uh, hard to understand, but apparently we seem to be doing this. And I suspect some of it is trade secret because I've tried to understand in some areas, but I can't seem to. Um, Fast search algorithms that occur conventionally, of course, uh, say one, one million 
telephone entries and you want to search for any one of them, you do one at a time. So you uh, end searches. In quantum search, it's a square root of n because now you're searching uh, through these states that have been paired and that are interfered. And it's a factor of you know, square root uh, opportunity, enormous speed gains. And I'll come to that in a minute. Next, let's talk about um, a physical quantum computer. And this is a schematic of one they've done at IBM at the Watson Research Center in New York. Uh, there's a classical computer that is, uh, that's a quantum computer, which sits in a dilution refrigerator uh, that brings it down to 15 millikelvin. Uh, by the way, just to appreciate that, what that means, uh, liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. Liquid helium that I used to use in my experiments when I was at Berkeley uh, is at 4 Kelvin. Outer space is at 2.7 Kelvin. So this is significantly cool, cooler than outer space and only 15,000th of a degree above absolute zero. In fact, we can do that is again mind boggling to me what kind of refrigerators they have. Uh, control electronics and a geophysicism junction that serves as this, this uh, incredible uh, transmon qubit gate. A user gets on his classical computer, converts the classical program to quantum algorithms for qubits. The qubits are manipulated by these incredible microwave pulses, extremely short, short pulses, picosecond pulses, which go in there and affect these qubits. And by the way, the way they describe it is that they go over and just kind of gently nudge them, but not hard enough to, do this, to have them disintegrate. So, so these precious little qubits are just gently nudged and then they flip, they bit flip or they, they entangle or they do other these insane things one at a time. And, and then the results come back to the classical computer. Here is a actual photograph of one of the 15 IBM computers from five qubits to 53 qubits, um, a, a close up of a, um, a junction, uh, what is known as a Josephson junction. Um, it's a art, effectively an artificial atom, 100 nanometers in size, uh, micro resonators, which, which puts out these pulses that I mentioned that would affect the qubit. And picture of uh, the big boss there, Dario Gill uh, and a uh, and a quantum computer, and there's 15 of them in thing. At Google, Sundar Pichai, uh, the CEO, wants his face to be seen with his new toy, the Sycamore, and uh, uh, they announced in February last year, I believe, that they finished a calculation in three minutes and 20 seconds that the world's supercomputer would take 10,000 years. Well, IBM said, yeah, not quite true. We can actually do it in two and a half days on our super supercomputer at the Oak Ridge National Labs. So it's a little bit of a spat and Google will not answer. But net net is, Google was able to demonstrate incredibly fast computing with about 72 qubits. So speed, well, you know, today's computers are not quite fast enough and we complain but I suspect sometime in the future, they'll be a lot faster than us. They'll be done and then say, what am I doing here? Variety of qubits at Google uh, and at IBM. Um, they, they both use superconducting loops, as I mentioned, these Joseph junctions. Uh, these guys have a 50 microsecond longevity or lifetime. Uh, they've improved it now to 100 microseconds or so, I'm told. Uh, uh, and they can entangle as many as nine of them simultaneously, but I think it's more. Uh, Intel has quantum dots, uh, which are artificial atoms. Uh, um, and, and they have a longer lifetime, but apparently more difficult uh, entangling. Uh, small companies like INQ have gone to the business creating uh, electrically charged atoms and so on. In my mind, Quantum evolution is like the evolution of transistors going from vacuum tubes in the 50s to gallium arsenide transistors in the 60s to silicon uh, TTL logic and all those computer uh, transistors and, and memory integrated circuits and so on. And I believe today we're in the 1950s or 60s in terms of qubits. 
programming. Uh, there's a bunch of people and IBM especially, they have online user guides. You can have a pre-prepared quantum algorithm. Um, they have the drag and drop menus uh, for five qubit systems especially. Uh, and they provide you available gates. They tell you about the coherence, how long these guys will last. Uh, and then you can actually run a small uh, uh, entanglement, a thing where you entangle these two qubits and, and sure enough, they came out after some nanoseconds probably uh, to have exactly equal numbers. Various companies are getting into it. Zapata and Cambridge uh, Quantum Computing provide quantum ready applications. There's a fair amount of venture money that's gone into it now. Um, and IBM especially is going to, is the process, is, has created a community. Uh, uh, as of May last year, they had about 230,000 users. Uh, they've done uh, 180 billion uh, quantum hardware, uh, you know, entanglements and interferences and so on, and about 49 billion simulations. Uh, they have 15 publicly available computers from five to 53 qubits, uh, 12,000 users a month. And the five qubit machines are available to try out for free. And I can get you a, a website that you can go in and sign up. They've done algorithms for major users like Daimler Benz for batteries, ExxonMobil for, of course, uh, petroleum uh, analyses, JP Morgan for derivative pricing. So a lot has been happening uh, in helping their, their big customers, for which they, I'm sure they charge some serious money. What can we do with it? Factorizing big numbers. That's the first most obvious thing. Though I won't hold your, my breath. I think it's gonna take a lot bigger quantum computing power than we have to refactor these very large numbers on a routine basis. So uh, I think the fear of uh, breaking RSA uh, with quantum computing is still quite, quite a distance away. However, cryptography, uh, 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 that is a more likely scenario and may happen I think sooner than uh, factorizing big numbers. The other areas of, um, and the Chinese have gotten into this, especially with quantum entanglement to create uh, what they call an unbreakable internet. But the mo most interesting part and has the biggest, I think, long-term opportunity is simulation of nature, uh, chemistry, material design, and medicines. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, if you were to take beryllium hydride as a simple little molecule with just six electrons, beryllium, in the middle and two hydrogen atoms, very small, simple BEH2. Uh, to do this in classical computers, to really analyze this, our model requires solving a matrix of about 400,000 uh, by 400,000, oh no, 40,000 by 40,000 matrix elements. Very difficult, uh, not impossible. Uh, they did a six qubit solution on a quantum computer. It was published in Nature a few, few years ago. Uh, and it's, uh, it's surprisingly accurate, and they were able to get this uh, reproducibly uh, on a quantum computer uh, that simulated this, this molecule. Understanding nature and replicating processes is another area that we are thinking of doing, people are thinking of. Uh, if you look at ammonia, which is a very important part of uh, creating fertilizers, uh, a fundamental requirement, the Haber process, for example, but it requires high temperature, high pressure, uh, low conversion yield, uh, consumes a lot of energy. And you can ask, why is there a better way? Uh, and mother nature seems to do it. Uh, these critters called cyanobacteria uh, and I've said others, they produce ammonia at room temperature naturally. And so of course the question is asked, why can we not use quantum computing to figure this out? And and replicate what nature is doing. Of course, complex molecules, um, protein spikes and coronavirus, there's actually a bunch of people using quantum chemistry to understand these uh, proteins and modeling drugs, penicillin and others. These cannot be done on conventional computers uh, very easily, if at all. The exponential forecast for growth. Um, as you may know, Moore's law uh, is uh, every year and a half, uh, doubling every year and a half or even two years now. Uh, they're expecting to double every year, much faster than Moore's law for semiconductor technology. And indeed they've seen that 
uh, until 2020, and IBM at least is very optimistic that they can beat that. So, so you can just imagine uh, a few hundred qubit systems occurring uh, in the next few years. And of course, if they can manage this whole problem of decoherence uh, and manage and control the, the, the uh, complexity of, of uh, getting the answers out uh, before it all disintegrates, uh, then it, it'd, be, it'd be incredible. And in fact, IBM has now postulated that uh, the, a thing called quantum volume is very important. A combination both of, uh, in fact, there it is, it's, it's written out here on the left-hand side, the quantum volume, a combination of number of bits along with the coherence and uh, that enables you to get quantum volume. Future is where uh, we take conventional bits technology, qubits, you know, neurons based AI, and combine it to, with uh, cloud computing, uh, accelerate discovery and the like. There's a, there's a picture that IBM puts out. And of course, all that is well and nice, but you know, we may have days when the computer's broken every way possible simultaneously. <laughs> That's the way it's gonna be. When it, when it does go down, it'll probably go down badly. But we, we've gotten over that in the past uh, with our computers once upon a time. Uh, and I think we'll find a way in the next few decades to have this happen. Question of ethics has been brought up now over the last few weeks. Um, various computing scientists have called uh, for a discussion uh, and awareness that in this era when we can start modeling complex molecules uh, and with that, um, what do we do empirically like the CRISPR technology, which is somewhat empirical. Uh, you, we can easily take that and, and make that more of a uh, predictive uh, or, or, or something we can, we can plan in advance. So um, there is a video that you may, I can send you a link to, uh, to call to action uh, for, this, for ethical guidelines. And so in closing, uh, this is what a 1960s digital mainframe computer looked like. Uh, and today's quantum computer, I think this is a picture from Google that shows uh, two young people are able to work on these things. Uh, I suspect, uh, you know, we will be in a world where quantum computers will, will exploit true quantum properties to do probabilistic calculations on ultra large entangled data in super short time frames. A personal note. Um, that's IBM Watson Research Center. That's me in 1974 with my hot 280Z as a fresh PhD from Berkeley, uh, the same building where they have these incredible machines now. Uh, and actually I also did something that made me somewhat famous. And my work was on the cover of the journal of IBM Journal Research, Research and Development. And those lines you see there are about 250 nanometer lines. They were the most advanced technology uh, that we did the electron beam lithography and I solved the problem of, of proximity corrections with these gigantic things. And, and uh, just to let you know, today we have 15 nanometer size computing uh, or, or, or transistors that are routine. And this was 250 nanometers that were at the leading cutting edge in the 1970s and 1980s. So it's a... It's an amazing world. I uh, stop now and thank you for listening and happy to answer questions. Mahir, thank you very much. That was a surprisingly understandable at the, the starting level. Uh, a couple, couple I really of... didn't want it to be understandable, George, but I tried. <laughs> okay, um, a couple of different questions. Are there categories of problem? These are from the chat. Martin asks, are there categories of problems that really aren't appropriate for quantum computers and are really more appropriate for the discrete nature of the classical computer? Oh, I think majority of the problems are still doable by, by conventional classical computers. Um, they need, you know, like these supercomputers, a huge amount of uh, um, raw power and memory and speed. Uh, but a lot of it's doable. Uh, but when you start getting into things and trying to understand uh, at the molecular level, which is 
uh, not done routinely. I mean, not most of us need it. Uh, then you you can, uh, and then of course also derivative pricing, where, where there are so many thousands of variables. Uh, uh, anything that require that has a, a large basis set is ripe for using quantum computing where you can take these qubits, align them to those complex basis sets, entangle them, and do the magic to have answers come out. Okay. Um, could this be used to produce Bitcoins? Could this be used to what? Sorry? Produce, produce Bitcoins. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Okay. Does the, be, but... does the technology inherently require ultra low temperatures? Oh, yes, uh, for now. Uh, but though, though they are working on various ions that are potentially close to, you know, uh, acceptable temperatures. I don't know the answer, but but they are working on uh, ions that are that could be stable. M moving away from the super ultra low, <clears throat> those of us who've dealt in superconductors understand there's a humongous difference as you move up in, in the temperature range. Um, okay, um, you did not in the countries working on this. You didn't mention Israel. That's a surprise. Oh no, they are there. They're there in, in, on the map. Okay. I mean, I don't know what you mean by uh, uh, countries. Um, um, uh, as far as I know, Israel, South Korea, Taiwan, India, everyone is very actively involved. Now, I don't think they are building quantum computers, but they are connected to guys who are building them and accessing them, as far as I know. Somehow one thinks the Israelis probably are building them, but that's an intuitive would, sense. Would surprise me. Um, okay, again, can you talk about how many states a qubit can could have? Okay, um, uh, and can I think about them as um, that I could say, for example, I wanted to build a sixteen-state qubit machine. A sixteen qubit machine, you mean? No. A qubit can have a certain number of states. Yes. Suppose what I wanted to do was to create a technology base that was built around using 12 states, using 16 states. In other words, so I, I would build a technology. Okay. Can I do that? Yeah, only one qubit. Uh, I mean, two qubits will get you 512 states. Okay. So the number of states is is, is inherent in the qubit. Yes. I mean, how many, how many it, states well, again? <laughs> um, okay. It's qubits can be encoded to have an enormous number of uh, of bits of information. Yes, as we call it. And, and as few as two qubits could have 512 bits of information. Okay. So, and it, it's an exponential factor. Uh, as you saw, uh, 30 qubits uh, has some gigabytes. I forget now the numbers now, uh, but it's in that chart. Uh, so, uh, I hope that answers. I mean, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it, all, finally it's, it's the number of bits that are effectively available that are encoded in the qubit. Okay. Um, given pairing, is it possible to use pairing in such a way that if you lost all the information in the starting pair, it would still exist in the second pair? Oh. Uh, not sure I fully understood, but okay. If, think, if, you think are, about if, it. if you're a paired system, yep. Whatever you've done to this unit of the pair manifests itself instantaneously other and the other partner. Okay. If this is spin up, the other one is spin down. If it's if it's a pair that came and spin up and down together. Okay. 
Uh, you said that qubits seek correspondence. What does that mean? Cubic seek correspondence. Did I say that? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, that I'm... may be our interpretation of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, seek correspondence. Um, well, qubits are entities that are manipulated through these gates to get them to interfere. Of course, there's natural superposition already in there, built in, and there's entanglement. Okay. So, so that's what we we're able to do with these little fellows. Okay, we have a number of people who are thanking you because uh, they thought that you did a great job of communicating a very difficult topic. Um, I'm going to do a real quick sales pitch. We have two two uh, meetings in March. They will both be associated with solar energy. One of them will be a on March 10th, a catch up with where is Oakmont relative to solar? And the second one on March 24th is where does it look like the Biden administration is taking us and how might that affect us? And then the two presentations in April are going to be on fires, which you believe wildfires. So one will be related to, again, where we are now technologically. And then the second one will deal with where we're going. Mahir, thank you so much. I just uh, want to make one, 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 one strange comment. Uh, you, I, I, I know I apologize for the time. I, I did not do my Starlink presentation, which was just a, or a little thing, but I just received yesterday a note from Starlink that they actually are offering uh, uh, a service right in our Oakmont area. I don't know if anybody else received Starlink things, but I, I did, and I'm going to investigate it and see what it means to us. Great. Uh, I appreciate your keeping us all informed. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you Thank We're you going to close the meeting now. Thank you all. Outstanding. Thank you. Outstanding job, man.